it's my pleasure and, and, and honor to welcome everyone to today's webinar on uh, leadership for justice and equality uh, with the Minister of Justice uh, for Northern Ireland, Miss um, Naomi Long. We'll get to um, Naomi in a moment, uh, but before we do, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mr. Andrew Elliott. He's the new director of Northern Ireland Bureau in Washington, and he's the partner um, partner organization with us here at Boston College on this webinar, and uh, we hope a, a, a webinar series indeed um, with other members uh, of the Northern Ireland political leadership um, units uh, to speak to us in the future. Um, Andrew uh, began his, his time with Northern Ireland Service Service in 1988, and he became a senior civil servant in 2000. Prior to coming to um, Washington, he served in Brussels um, from 2015 to 2019. Um, so it must have been a, a really interesting time to be there, of course, with the, the Brexit vote in the middle of it. Um, Andrew, of course, has a very impressive and long uh, career history, but I do want to also highlight that you were the Secretary of the Parades Commission from 2000 to 2004. So you're no, um, you, you're, you're, you are not naive about um, working in politically uh, fraught and, and difficult and uh, intense um, situations. But thank you very much for partnering with us on this this event, and thank you for um, uh, opening opening this. So, Andrew, I'll turn it over to you for now. Thank you very much, Bob. It's a, a real pleasure to, to be here with you today and uh, also particularly to have the opportunity to introduce Northern Ireland's Justice Minister. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you, Bob, for many years and, 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 and also for that, that we've come up with this idea of a series of Northern Ireland focused fireside chats, which I think has the potential to be a really interesting way of continuing engagement at a challenging time. Um, I wanted to start by saying that the Northern Ireland Executive has overseas offices not just in Washington DC but also in Brussels and Beijing and that's important in the context of this particular event because that's how I really got to know Naomi Long when she was elected as, uh, as the, I think the first Alliance MEP in the 20, on the 23rd of May 2019 um, and she was able to serve in that role until the end of January this year when of course the United Kingdom as a whole left the, the European Union in, in formal terms. Um, and uh, there are many issues about that that, that, that are still ongoing. Um, and and it, it's, it's, it's fair to say that, you know, the, the, the historic balance of, uh, of MEPs from Northern Ireland, there tended to be three members of the European Parliament from the region uh, elected right across the region. And the, the balance had always been uh, historically two unionists and one nationalist and and with the election of, of, of Naomi Long that changed that balance uh, in a way that was I think in some ways very new and, and quite interesting for the for the parliament and the various institutions uh, because of the the change in pattern there. Um, the executive of course itself is a very diverse uh, group of people ranging right across the the spectrum from uh, people from an Irish Republican background right through to people from a, a pro-British uh, unionist uh, background uh, and of course with uh, Naomi's party uh, positioned really in relation to wanting a shared future and, and, and people working together to develop a shared community and a shared, um, a shared approach to, to many different things. Um, the, the, the key to, to success in, it has been this, the success of the Good Friday Agreement in delivering those institutions, uh, which allows 10 different ministers to sit together in the executive and to make really challenging and difficult decisions collaboratively. Uh, and it's my role out here in, um, in, in North America, both in Canada and in the United States, uh, to try and explain just how much work goes into uh, the challenging decision of uh, uh, the challenging work of, of making decisions across such a wide spectrum of, of, of political interests. Um, but really, really important in, in building and consolidating the peace uh, that we have in Northern Ireland, which is so much uh, has created so much benefit and, and, and from which there is so much to learn, you know, right across a, a whole range of different situations around the world. The Bureau's links with Boston College, of course, have gone on for many, many years and long, uh, and long before, before I arrived here. Uh, and it's really great, Bob, that we've not allowed the COVID virus to prevent us from keeping up the connectivity and the engagement. 
Uh, and this, the, the, the discussion today, I think policing injustice, I mean, it's very hard to think of an issue that could be more topical in terms of some of the things that have featured uh, in the last year or two in the United States, where there've been some really uh, quite significant political challenges and a lot of media attention on policing injustice and on, on people feeling that they're getting a fair deal and whether or not there's a need for reform or, or otherwise. So I really look forward to Naomi Long uh, having the chance to share her perspective on leadership in this area of justice and equality today uh, as we collectively explore these issues together. I think there's loads we can learn from each other uh, and I'm very much really keen now to hand over to Naomi and to hear her speak. So thank you very much for that opportunity to introduce. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. We really do appreciate the partnership and we look forward to working with you um, through the future. I'm excited to, to continue to engage and um, I know um, over time we'll get back in person to, um, to, to Northern Ireland and have visitors once again um, from Northern Ireland. Ironically, it was the, uh, in the final days just before the, um, the lockdowns and the pandemic um, started here in the U.S. We did have a delegation in um, from uh, Northern Ireland, uh, here to study uh, business acceleration. Um, our guest today is uh, Naomi Long. She's the leader of the Alliance Party, and um, she is the Minister of Justice in Northern Ireland. It's a real honor to have her here. She began her political career um, in 2010 uh, by defeating uh, Peter Robinson. Um, there were some turbulent times uh, between then and 2016 when uh, she joined the assembly uh, and also took over the leadership of the Alliance Party. And just earlier this year, she was appointed um, as Minister for Justice. Um, the Alliance Party has had uh, many great um, electoral victories of late and, and in some cases have been, uh, I think, a surprise to people who are, have been watching from the outside. It's been interesting to watch this um, development. And uh, so it's, it's my pleasure to welcome um, Minister Long here today with us. Uh, Minister, I, I think we would like to start really with how you entered into politics and why um, you, you ran for office. You studied engineering at Queens um, and you, you took this interest in the constituency seat uh, that, that you, you, know, you, you won and, and you beat um, Peter Robinson, who is a giant of, uh, of Northern Irish politics. I mean, why did you get involved and, and, and what led you to that? Um, well, I would love to say that I had a great plan um, all along. Um, unfortunately, that would be a lie. Um, I came to politics largely by accident rather than design. I studied engineering and that's what I thought I would end up spending the rest of my life um, doing. And for me, I was not particularly interested in politics. I'd grown up obviously at a time during the Troubles. Um, I was born in 71. So my entire growing up was really against the backdrop of the Troubles in Northern Ireland. And my experience of politics was not a positive one. It was one where it was constantly fractious, constantly sectarian, constantly um, negative. And my experience is one of politics failing to deliver. So I never really had any interest in politics in the sense that I didn't see politics as a career for me. But I think all of us were very touched and affected by the politics of the region because of the impact that it was having on ordinary people's lives. When I graduated from university, it was 1994, and um, we were just having the first very tentative ceasefires in Northern Ireland. And that ended up eventually leading to the Good Friday Agreement and everything that has flowed from that. But for me, it was the first period in Northern Ireland's history where I genuinely felt that there was an opportunity for real change. And so at that point, I decided that, first of all, I made a decision that I wanted to stay in Northern Ireland rather than go off and find a new life for myself after university somewhere else. Um, but I also decided if I was going to do that, that I wanted to play a constructive role in trying to bring forward that change in society that I wanted to see. And so it was after I graduated that I first joined the party, but I joined as an ordinary member and I didn't expect to ever be involved um, in frontline politics. Um, it wasn't until 2001 I was approached um, by a local councillor in my area who asked if I would consider running for Belfast City Council and I said no, definitely not. Um, and I said no three times but he was persistent and eventually convinced me to stand by telling me that I probably wouldn't get elected anyway. Um, and so I decided I would run um, for the experience but not really expecting to get elected. But I was elected. 
um, to Belfast City Council in 2001. Um, and 18 months later, I was elected to the Assembly um, because we had a, a, an Assembly election at that point um, because there'd been a collapse of the institutions. And so I ran in that election again, not particularly optimistic given the very polarised nature of the campaign. But I was elected to the Assembly um, and that was my first kind of experience of being in full-time politics. And when I left my engineering job, which I had been at for 10 years, I took a six month leave of absence expecting that I would end up back there someday. Um, but in the end, that's not the direction of travel that I ended up going in. And for me, it was really, I suppose, I joined Alliance because the kind of society that I want to live in is one where people are not labels, they're not in pigeonholes, unionist, nationalist, Catholic, Protestant, but where we take each other um, as human beings, as people with a shared history, um, with a complex history, a contentious history, um, but one that actually, I think, can bring us together because we have lived on this piece of land for a long time. And I think we need to learn to share it in a sensible and a, a productive way. And whatever our long-term aspirations for the future um, of Northern Ireland, I believe that those will only be successful if we learn, first of all, to live with each other in the here and now um, and find ways of overcoming our differences. And so that kind of politics was what I saw reflected in the Alliance Party. It was at that stage the only party that drew people from right across the community in significant numbers. Um, and it was the only party that wasn't wedded to a, a long term aspiration um, in terms of the constitutional position and the border question, but was focused on the day to day politics. And for me, as an engineer and a problem solver, um, that really attracted me because I think that for every problem, we need to also seek solutions. And so Alliance seemed like a natural home for me to be in. Um, and I haven't ever regretted um joining the party, I have occasionally <laughs> regretted um, going into political life. I think you would be mad as a politician, not occasionally, to wonder what if. Um, but I have to say on the whole, I think it was the right decision. And um, we've achieved a lot together as a party and as a group, but we've also seen a massive transformation um, in society in Northern Ireland um, since I first joined back in the 1990s. I mean, the city I live in is unrecognisable now compared with Belfast in the 1990s and um, it's one that I'm very proud of and it's still um, it's still difficult at times. We still have our challenges um, and I am certainly confident that there's still a lot of work for us all to do. Um, but I feel we have made real progress and I think that um, at least some of that is down to the fact that more and more people um, are looking for something more than simply constitutional politics, that they're actually looking for delivery on the ground in a way that will really affect their lives in a positive way. And I think more and more people also no longer see themselves simply as a label, but see themselves as individuals with a whole range of aspirations that aren't always completely um, explained through their response to the constitutional issues. I think in the last few years, things like Brexit and the challenges around that um, have again kind of shaken up the narrative because people are really questioning now um, how they see themselves because being European is a huge part of who I am. It's a huge part um, for a lot of people in Northern Ireland, but it was also a very unifying thing um, to be members of the European Union. That was an identity that we could share as a community. And I think that that has really challenged people, the kind of feeling of loss around that. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons why one of our best ever elections was that final European election, because I think the people in Northern Ireland really galvanised around the idea that actually being unified as Europeans was something that really mattered to them. Um, and it's just quite sad, really, that we're now in a situation where we'll be removed from the European Union. But I keep reminding people we will still be Europeans at the end of it all. Thank you, Minister. There's an awful lot there to to, to unpack and uh, to, to engage with, um, and I think we'll get to it all. Um, before I uh, continue with the, the our discussion, I would like to invite the audience to ask questions either via the Q&A function or the chat function. I can see them here. Uh, please do send your questions in. Uh, we're always eager to get those across to, to our guests. Um, Minister, I just want to take a, a little bit of a step back before we get into the European identity, the success of Alliance, all of that is very interesting. Um, 
but there was that period after Alliance introduced the the um, the notion into the the, um, the city council to limit the number of days that flags could be flown over city hall. There's a period of violence um, in the city, and then there was an interesting reaction to that. There was the uh, if people might recall uh, back in the Bel Belfast take back the city. Uh, movement and people really took some pride in the way Belfast had transformed and wanted to to get out again. But during that period, Alliance took a lot of um, you know took not only a lot of criticism, but there were a lot of physical instances um, that were quite scary. I think uh, you know there were arson attacks and so on and so forth. I mean, during that period, was there ever a point at which you thought that you know your desire to make a contribution? Um, to not outweigh the challenges around that? Or did you ever doubt yourself and, 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 and the way you were going? Or did those instances um, you know, compel you to become engaged and, and, and continue your political career? Yeah, I mean, very much the second. Um, it, it really, for me, brought home the reality that although we were sitting there and it was, you know, it was 2012, 2013, we still hadn't progressed as a society beyond the point where people thought that it was legitimate to use violence for political means. And that fundamentally is something that I thought we should have left behind. Um, and so for me, it was challenging because the violence was directed at me and my colleagues and, and the people that I work with. Our offices were burned, we had death threats, we received bullets in the post, we, you know, we were under constant pressure and attack and it felt like we had slipped back in time um, to a much darker period. But I felt very much that we had made the right decision. And I think if you, if you really are a conviction politician and you really believe in what you do, then that sustains you through difficult times. And so I believed that we had made the right choice. I believed it was a fair and an equitable choice. I believed that it was a way of showing respect for those in the city who are ardently unionist and hugely proud of their British identity but also a way of acknowledging that now in the city that is a minority, not a majority any longer. And so there are many in the city who don't um, see themselves as British. They are very much Irish citizens and that's how they want to be portrayed. And I think you've got to find a balance in all of these things in terms of how we express our identity in a way that isn't threatening, that isn't, um, isn't provocative and isn't essentially triumphalist um, when we're in a mixed community with very different views. And so I was confident about the decision. It would be a lie to say that there weren't days I wondered why we bothered at times because it became very, very difficult. And it lasted for um, a full three years of just relentless attacks. Um, and ultimately I lost my Westminster seat as an MP because of it. Um, and there was a huge campaign um, around that time to try to get me unseated. But that's democracy. And actually, I think it's entirely right that if people disagreed with the position the party took and um, they were able to vote to say how they felt about it. What wasn't democracy was all of the attacks and the violence and the intimidation. And I certainly wasn't going to give in to that. If I'm voted out, that's fair enough. That's democracy. But I wasn't going to be bullied out of my position. Um, and I made that very clear at the start. I received my first death threat in politics only a year um, after I went into politics in 2001, I was elected to Belfast City Council. And in uh, 2002, I received the first death threat I ever received. And at that point, I did stop and think, is this really what I want to do with the rest of my life? Um, because I could have walked away. I wasn't well known. I wasn't recognisable. I could have disappeared off and gone back to engineering and it would have been fine. But I felt very strongly that somebody had to do this job, that somebody had to speak up um, for change and for progress, that somebody had to challenge um, the kind of behaviour that we were being subjected to. And at the end of the day, I couldn't see why I, could, I should expect someone else to do that job if I wasn't willing to do it myself. And so I decided at that point that I would stay in politics and that I would continue to commit myself to what I was doing. Um, and I don't regret that because I believe that every one of us has an opportunity to change our community, to, to transform our neighbourhood and relationships in our society. And I think we all have an obligation to play a part. And this is the part that I have been fortunate enough to be able to play. Um, and it comes with its downsides at times, but I don't regret doing it. And I think it's important 
um, for me that when those things happen, I always remember why I got involved in politics to begin with, and it was to make change. And unfortunately, when you make change, it's not always welcome. Um, and that's something that you have to be prepared for. But I didn't get involved in politics because I wanted to be popular. I wanted to get involved in politics because I wanted to change my community. I wanted to see things move on. Um, and that means challenging people's traditions, aspirations, their thoughts, their prejudices. And sometimes that's uncomfortable territory for all of us. Um, but I think it's important as politicians that we're willing to do that um, because it's the only way we'll really make progress. The, it, you know, you said, you said a lot of very interesting things in there about identity, uh, what a political party is about, um, about delivering uh, for people um, and about the, the importance of, of the role. Um, you know, you've already talked a little bit about it, but in, last year, um, Alliance did very well at the party, uh, at, the, at the polls. You have big aspirations. I think um, you said recently you'd like to be the largest party um, in Northern Ireland at some point. You weren't sure if it was going to happen under your tutelage, but you'd like it to kind of set you on that direction. I mean, you know, what, what is it about the growth of Alliance right now? Is this a sort of a, a short-term reaction? Um, some, some commentators have suggested, well, the, the assembly wasn't functioning or it's a reaction to Brexit. Or are there, do you think there are longer term shifts that are taking place in Northern Ireland where there's maybe a de-alignment of, of people and parties? Uh, a lot of commentators have focused on, you know, the, the non-aligned party in Northern Ireland and how it has had limited success, you know, over, over time. I mean, what are your thoughts on, on that? I think that there are a number of things that, that have come together. So yes, I think, for example, Brexit had a massive um, impact in terms of challenging people's perceptions of parties. So for whatever reason, the unionist parties aligned themselves very much with Brexit, even though the majority of unionists weren't necessarily um, comfortable with that decision. It was a very mixed bag, but there was no real strong unionist voice um, speaking out against Brexit. Um, equally, um, there were those who felt that, for whatever reason, Sinn Féin had kind of politicised Brexit around trying to drive home the point about a united Ireland, which is a legitimate aspiration, but people felt perhaps they'd been opportunistic in the way that they'd pursued um, the point at that, at that stage. And so there were challenges all round, and I think um, that made people rethink some of those kind of traditional votes that they'd made. I think also that there was an opportunity, I mean, as with everything, we had a one um, MEP who was standing down. There were two who were almost definitely going to be re-elected, but the third seat very much felt like it was open for challenge. And so I think the fact that all of those things coalesced at one time gave people, if you like, an encouragement um, to feel that they could make a change. The biggest challenge for us, I suppose, over the years has been the notion that a vote for us is a wasted vote. Because if you're in a very bipartisan, um, very polarised political system, the tradition is to think that you should only vote between the two main candidates. And one of the reasons I was elected um, in 2010 to Westminster and unseated Peter Robinson is because I managed to position myself as one of the two main candidates, despite being in a very unionist constituency where, in practical terms, most people would have thought the Ulster unionists on paper were, in, were better placed to unseat him. But for whatever reason, um, I was Lord Mayor at the time, I had profile, I had standing, and I think people felt that there was an opportunity that I could be that challenge. And I think that sometimes it's about that. Other times I think it's about, um, as I say, Brexit, challenging people's perceptions and loyalties. And I think once people have voted for other parties, once they've crossed that Rubicon of not voting down unionist and nationalist lines, it becomes much easier for them to really think about who to vote for on the basis of delivery and what they're achieving and, and whether or not they actually agree with what, with what they're trying to do. Um, but it wasn't just a flash in the pan because we'd already seen a major increase at local government, for example, where we'd seen a major um, upsurge in our votes there. And that wasn't Brexit related. That was simply because we were able to break out of the greater Belfast area. We were able to get representation in the west of Northern Ireland for the first time in a long time and just get a much more diverse group of candidates elected. Um, we built on that with the European election, but then we went on to win a first past the post election for Westminster again in December. So there's obviously a momentum there, which 
certainly in polling recently would seem to have been sustained. And I think perhaps ideas just have their time. I think that there's a new generation of young people who are growing up in Northern Ireland who are broadly liberal in their perspectives and their outlooks. They are people who want the kind of freedoms that they see um, in other parts of these islands and indeed further afield. They don't want to be constrained by the kind of old style of politics that they're used to seeing in Northern Ireland. And I think that those people are looking for a different voice and they've found Alliance to be that voice. So it's kind of, I guess, an old solution to what is a new problem in that we had come there initially as a party to try to bring people together and to create that sense um, of people being freed up from the, the kind of labels that society here attaches to them, giving people the right to, to identify in the way that they choose. But that's an idea that has come of, its, of, of age now, because I think just generally in terms of younger people, um, they they do have an interest in those kind of more socially aware and more liberal politics um, that we're involved with. That's interesting, and um, the the focus of identity um, c continues to be a major major one. Um, it, it became a major issue around Brexit. You yourself or have already mentioned um, that you identify as European, and you said very recently. Um, that the UK is working its way through a constitutional crisis in relation to Brexit. I'm saying to the European parties, uh, give us time. Um, and so I, I want to talk a little bit about Brexit um, here. Uh, obviously, um, the, the withdrawal agreement, uh, Northern Ireland Protocol has been brought into doubt by the internal market bill. You also recently said, and I think and we can talk a little bit more about this later when we turn to justice, but you said it's important uh, just the other day that 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 people follow the rule of law. And it's an important thing that you instill culturally across society. And, and the internal markets bill presents a threat there as well. But when it comes to the, um, to the status in Northern Ireland um, in relation to the, the Republic of Ireland, in relation to the rest of the United Kingdom, in relation to Europe and, and what Brexit means, I mean, what are, what are right now the immediate challenges that need to be addressed? And, and is there time actually to address those challenges? Well, at a very practical level, there are major challenges. I mean, we're the only part of the UK with a land border with another state in the EU. So that's a major challenge. I think an even greater challenge is the significance of that land border in terms of the politics and psychology in Northern Ireland. I mean, this has been the major cleavage in Irish politics, North and South, for 100 years. So anything that involves the land border in Northern Ireland is going to be sensitive. It's going to be difficult. But we're also surrounded by the Irish Sea. So we're a place apart from the rest of the United Kingdom. We're divided by the Irish Sea from them. We have a land border with the South. We're in a very difficult and unique position. And I think where Theresa May's deal in fairness tried to capture that as an advantage for Northern Ireland, what we ended up with under Boris Johnston was very much a kind of zero sum arrangement uh, with the protocol. I'm not a fan of the protocol and the withdrawal agreement because I think that it was very much the second best option that we had. Um, it was always going to be less effective for us um, than remaining in the European Union. We would have much preferred if we had to leave the European Union that the entirety of the UK would have remained within the customs and the single market because we think that by doing so um, we would have minimised the impact of that in terms of freedom of movement of goods and services, but also all of the other cooperation and collaboration um, that we very much rely on on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the fact that the government not only opted to follow through with Brexit on a very marginal vote, one which divided the UK in terms of the nations, you know, Scotland and Northern Ireland against Wales and, and England for, um, but also one that divided people in terms of their kind of ambitions. I think to do that, not just to follow through, but to to follow through with a hard Brexit, I think was really challenging because even people who voted for Brexit didn't necessarily endorse the kind of very hard end um, that the government seems to continue to pursue. So I think there are real challenges, real practical challenges for us in terms of how we're going to trade across borders, how we're going to ensure a free flow of goods and services um, and so on within the UK, but also allow our businesses to continue to be competitive, to work north-south, to cooperate as they do. 
And also there will be challenges, I think, in the security space, which we can talk about in more detail later, because we will have challenges around information sharing, cooperation, um, extradition, and all of those things, which have been very much part of the fabric of the European Union, those cooperations. But if we don't get a full uh, future security partnership negotiated alongside the trade deal, we will find ourselves falling back on protocols that date to the 1950s. And, you know, with all respect to the 1950s, you can't police 2020 and beyond um, with the tools from 1950. So we've got to be realistic about the lack of agility that that will leave us with in terms of real time data sharing and cooperation. There are opportunities through the protocol for us to be able to negotiate bilateral agreements with each of the European states. And we will we will have to do that. But that's time consuming. It's laborious and it's clunky as a comparison to the very streamlined access that we have at the moment. And it's crucial for us because we're on one piece of land. You know, we, we, we experienced at times during the 70s and 80s where criminals could literally stroll across the border and know that they couldn't be touched by the police and could taunt the police from a few feet across the border um, and know that there was nothing could be done. And the issue of extradition be became hugely politically contested. The European arrest warrant, good cooperation between um, the police and Angarda Shikana has really dealt with a lot of that. And I think it would be a shame if we ended up on picking those really close collaborative working relationships and with the Irish government um, to try and ensure that that doesn't happen. But it is challenging and there's no question about that. It's also challenging politically because for those who feel very much um, Irish citizens here, and I mean, I'm both Irish and British. I have both passports um, and both um, matter to me. They're, they're part of who I am and my, my identity. Um, it is a very difficult thing to feel that you've been removed from something that is part and parcel of being Irish, which is being a European citizen. And so that's been a challenge for people. I think it's also been very challenging um, in terms of the growth of English nationalism, which again has coloured some of the tone and the discourse um, around the politics. And it lacks a sensitivity, I think, to the Northern Ireland context and can make things quite fraught in terms of our engagements locally. Um, the government doesn't always understand the nuances of what they say and do in a Northern Ireland specific context. And so we have to be constantly reminding them um, of those sensitivities. So it has been a challenging period and I think Brexit will continue to be difficult. We will, I think, struggle, particularly given that we haven't got an agreement yet. So we have no clarity. So we're preparing for potentially no deal, you know, no deal but with the protocol, no deal without the protocol and potentially a deal that we don't know what it's going to look like. So you've got these different scenarios that we're trying to prepare for, but we're only months away um, from the point where we need readiness. And the difficulty with that, of course, particularly for legitimate businesses, is that if there is confusion or lack of clarity around what compliance looks like, then the black market economy will exploit that. Um, and that will be to the detriment um, of legitimate business. So it is a challenging time, I think, in Northern Ireland. We are doing our best to... Um, that we focus um, and that we deliver as best we can for the people we represent. We're trying to make sure that the government are paying attention and focused on our issues. But it is challenging and it will be challenging, I think, for the next number of, of months and beyond as we try to renegotiate our position um, relative to Europe and also relative to our nearest neighbours. Um, in your role as um, minister, and, and this is one thing I want to explore around um, Brexit, is that security challenge. Um, the question has come in from um, an attendee, a student here at Boston College. It's, it's an interesting question. And um, he writes uh, that just last month there was a case that emerged of where the new IRA had met officials in the Iranian embassy. Um, in Dublin. The new IRA was ultimately planning attacks, um, this questioner says, and on targets um, in collaboration with Hezbollah. I think the question, you know, the, the, the student really wants to know is, I mean, how can Northern Ireland collaborate with European partners um, through the, the Brexit period uh, to focus on, um, you know, transnational terrorism? Is there a, a really specific concern for you around this? 
Well, I think that there will be if we don't get agreements on, for example, data adequacy, which would allow us then to be able to share live information as we go into these investigations. There are a number of examples recently where um, the PSNI, the National Crime Agency, um, and the Angard Shikana have undertaken really quite detailed work in terms of, for example, their Operation Arbatia, which has been able to bring um, a number of alleged um, new IRA suspects into the system, into the justice system, and they will stand trial. Um, all of those things are very positive, but they require cooperation across um, these islands and beyond. We also know from other recent organised crime investigations, you know, for example, people have been buying property in Northern Ireland as a means of money laundering for organised crime gangs in Eastern Europe. So we may seem like a remote island off an island off the coast of mainland Europe, but actually when it comes to crime, that's irrelevant. If people see an opportunity, they will exploit it. And one of the things that they will exploit are any weaknesses in the justice system, which is why it's so important that we're able to continue to cooperate and to collaborate with all of our partners. The UK has played a leading role in much of the data sharing um, around Europe, and it's in Europe's interest that we continue to be able to have these partnerships because the crimes may be commissioned in Europe and the proceeds being laundered in Northern Ireland or vice versa. So it's important um, that we work together. I think that there is goodwill around a future security partnership. Um, there will be things I know we won't have. So we won't have access to um, the Schengen information system, for example, because that's something that we're not a Schengen country. We never have been, even when we were um, even when we were in the EU. But we could, for example, still get access and cooperation with Europol um, and with um, PROM and some of the other information databases. And I think it's absolutely crucial that we do because the alternative is that we have to rebuild something else as an alternative to that. And that's not just time consuming and laborious, but it's also duplication of effort. Um, and in a way that I think things will fall through the cracks inevitably. So I think it's really important that we don't open the justice system up to those sorts of weaknesses. Things like European arrest warrants really do matter because it means that those who commit crimes in one place can be returned there in order to face the courts. We all know that extradition can be a hugely thorny and long drawn out process. Um, and I believe that slow justice is no justice. So we've got to make sure um, that we can get people in front of the courts as quickly as possible. And the European arrest warrant actually helped us to do that. So there are, I think, huge issues there that we need to, that we need to challenge um, in terms of how the government goes forward. It isn't particularly helpful either, I would have to say, when you've seen your members of government saying things like they're willing to break the, the international law in limited, very limited and specific ways. I mean, that isn't a defence in any court anywhere <laughs> that you only broke the law in a limited and specific way because you thought it was in your interest. I mean, I think most criminals could hide behind that at one point or another, but it's not something that you should do. And I think that that breach of trust is a barrier to us being able to get a deal um, that will allow us to get the future security partnership put in place, as well as a good trade deal with clear demarcations and clear um, operational procedures for people who work in business, because what we need to do is embed good practice and compliance at the outset in order to protect um, legitimate business um, from the, the risks that are, are going to be there from organised crime um, and from black market economy companies. And I think that that's what we really need to be focused on. Um, visitors in Northern Ireland will notice that um, the, the physical infrastructure around policing and security has changed dramatically over the years. Justice was one of the last briefs to be devolved um, to, to the executive. Um, you, what are some of your challenges right now um, within policing? And, and I'm really curious, um, both as someone who watches Northern Ireland and, and as an American, looking at our own police system. I mean, over the years here at Boston College, we've had the privilege of working with the State Department on exchange programming that focused on police reform. And consistently, I heard from our partners in the U.S., meaning U.S. police officers, they thought that Patton was 
the patent reforms were, were, were really innovative and would be something of interest in the United States. Now we're obviously having this conversation in the US about the police community relations, uh, violence and justice overall. I mean, maybe you could talk a little bit about your role um, and, and policing and where the challenges are in, in Northern Ireland. And, and then maybe also reflect a little bit on, you know, what can other parts of the world like the United States learn from, from how Northern Ireland has evolved? Well, I suppose one of the challenges for me at the moment is that people assume that because I'm the justice minister, I'm in charge of policing. And that's one of the biggest misconceptions because actually in Northern Ireland, the patent reforms ensured that policing is completely independent um, of the justice department. So I'm responsible for things like um, justice policy, for setting sentencing uh, reviews and guidance and so on. But the, the individual elements of the justice system, the judiciary are completely independent. Public prosecution service is completely independent of my department and the police are completely operationally independent of my department. So we work together through the criminal justice board structure so that we can I suppose, align our priorities and ensure that we're all working in the same direction. We have focused conversations about what needs to happen and about where the challenges are. But it's it's a very different structure um, in that the, the board, the policing board, the Northern Ireland Policing Board that was created by Patton has responsibility for oversight um, of the chief constable and he has sole responsibility for operational matters within, within policing. The board will oversee that and make sure that the right decisions are made. They can hold investigations. They have accountability sessions on finance and planning and all sorts of other issues. And then we have an ombudsman on policing who will take forward investigations of complaints, again, completely independently um, of my office. In terms of trying to get community support for policing, Part of that was about how the policing board itself would be comprised. And so there are representatives of all of the main political parties in Northern Ireland on the policing board, but they are also alongside members who are not political members. So ordinary members of the public who have skills, whether it's an audit um, or strategic planning or um, institutional change or whatever it might be, who have been appointed to the policing board for a period um, and they then lead the different working groups within the policing board in terms of oversight. So there is a very delicate balance in that there is still political oversight of policing, but no one party is responsible for policing. And I think that that is actually a really healthy approach because it recognises that regardless of the changes at, at Stormont, regardless of the changes in political fortunes, um, every, com every community is invested in having decent um, and effective policing. There are challenges still. Um, there are still those in our society um, in dissident Republican organizations in particular, but also in loyalist areas where there's still paramilitary activity ongoing on a regular basis, who don't subscribe to the new institutions, who don't support policing and who try to keep the police out of those communities and to act as gatekeepers. And so part of my role um, in order to support the police in their work is to um, take forward um, par anti-paramilitarism work. So we do a lot of work within my department around organised crime, around paramilitarism and around um, things like police, and, uh, police um, and community safety partnerships so that we can actually get people to work directly with the police at a local level, um, at an area-based level to say what are the needs in the local community and how should we best um, fulfil those needs at a policing and justice level, whether that's with physical measures to try and protect communities, whether that's with, um, you know, in, engaging with particular problem um, areas or neighbourhoods, whether it's the police putting on particular individuals um, on the beat to, to engage with that community. So there's a lot of work that goes on to try to build community confidence, but it is difficult because policing with consent um, and that is the model that, that we follow, requires the community to buy into what the police are doing, but it also requires the police um, to keep the community on board. Um, there is no alternative in my view, um, other than a kind of a, a very negative form of policing, which is about imposing on people. And what we want to do is for the police to be an extension of what people's aspirations and hopes for their community um, are, and to be able to help them actually achieve that. I think 
by and large, the police do a good job. They're imperfect, as with any organisation um, made up of hundreds of different individuals. Um, people will have varying experiences um, when it comes to policing. But I think overall, um, the quality of policing that is being delivered is good. I think that the attitudes within the police service are good. And I think that the relationships within most communities are good but they're not perfect um, and there's still work to be done, I think, particularly in some of those more, um, I suppose, some of the, the more hard to reach communities in, in our society. And also, I think, in terms of tackling paramilitarism so that those communities can be reached. To put it in context, I mean, there are still parts of Northern Ireland that are difficult to police in a normal way. So we have a demilitarised police service by and large. Um, we have our police out, um, you know, engaging with communities on a regular basis, but there are places still where before they can go to those locations, there has to be a security assessment done because there is such a high level of threat against police officers. And so they're always having to balance that risk um, against the, the, the swiftness of their response and how that's perceived by the community. So it's a challenging environment for policing. But I think that they do a good job and I think that they're constantly pushing themselves to do better, which I think is just as important. Great. I, running throughout the theme of this conversation and, and throughout your period in, in Alliance has been a focus on community, right? And um, I think you said recently that I think there is an appreciation now amongst politicians, you mean, uh, for civic engagement and the importance of the importance of it as a way of dealing with complex and fraught issues that perhaps wasn't there before. There's a really good question that's come in here about the civic forums. I mean, do you see any possibility of the civic forums, uh, this uh, questioner would like to know, of, being, of those bodies being resurrected? I think not in the original form that they were in, but it is my view that part of the reason that we ended up in the difficulties that we ended up in with the assembly suspended for such a long period is because some of the parts of the agreement, um, such as proper forums for civic engagement, had kind of been abandoned and fallen to one side. And I think what happens is that when politics is working well, or at least it's functional, um, the broader community tends to step back and just get on with, with its business. And I think there was an assumption that politics would just manage to keep going. And when things started to go very far off um, and it was clear that things were going seriously wrong and that it was endangering the institutions, there was a nervousness about um, business or the community intervening um, because it was seen to be a highly charged political environment. I think it's really important actually that politics is connected with the community, that we do talk to business, that we talk to local community organisations, that we meet with religious leaders, that we talk to, um, you know, different sectors of our society, because I think we need their support, actually. It's not just that we need to be able to communicate our views to them, but we need their support to build the kind of community that we want to, that we want to see. And we actually sometimes need them to challenge us um, a lot more strongly than perhaps they have in the past. So I think that there has to be a better way of doing this. One of the things that's being looked at at the minute is about co-design of new policy, them to design the new policy. The, the, the previous civic forum fell into a bend because people felt it had become something of a talking shop, <clears throat> that it wasn't really productive and it wasn't really informed. I think that there is a way through things like citizens assemblies to perhaps engage people in more practical task-driven um, engagement, where we bring to them problems, challenges that we face as po political parties, whether it's because our political differences are, are hindering us in finding a solution, or whether it's because of the complexities of the task, things like climate change, where you're talking about lots of different moving parts that need to, that need to change in order to affect real difference. I think that there's a space that we can use for things like civic um, assemblies and so on to take pieces of work like that and make a, a really tangible contribution. I think the problem is if you ask people to give up five years of their lives to essentially meet like a shadow assembly, talk about the issues, but never have any influence on the outcomes. I think most, most people will say that's a waste of my time. If you engage people and say, here's a problem, how will we fix it? 
people are much more likely to engage. And so even within my own department where we have issues around, for example, domestic abuse and violence, the, the design of the legislation that we're taking through the assembly at the moment um, was very much one that we partnered with other organizations who provide support, counseling, assistance to people who are affected by domestic abuse. We looked at the, the kind of evidence base in terms of the academic evidence base around this. We brought all those people together and we worked with them to develop the legislation. And what we've found is now that when it's going through its normal committee procedures, people are on board with what we want to do because it's what they want to do. And I think if we engage with people on that basis, we're much more likely to create a more stable and a more uh, engaged society around us. I think the other thing to say is that some of the very politically charged issues, I think we do need people um, in wider society to be willing to step up and engage with those because I think when they end up being just a political tug of war, it can be a very zero sum game. There, there are a lot of questions that have come in. We're not going to get to them all. They're, they're all very um, excellent. I mean, one question that has come in um, is around um, the historical inquiry teams, uh, investigation of the past, and some of the work that you've been doing there. You've already begun to set up some of the structures administratively to address this. Can you give us an update on you know what you where you are right now um, uh, in the Justice Department with dealing with the past and where you hope to be able to get to and, and what a timeline might look like. Well, I suppose that there are a number of pieces to this puzzle, and not all of them are within my within my control. So um, we had the Stormont House Agreement, um, and we expected that that was going to be implemented. The UK government have then decided that they want to try to go a different route with this, so there will be further discussions. And I think that's also now being delayed by COVID and that has kind of taken things slightly um, longer than might be the case. We had started to do some work in terms of historical investigations unit and so on, but that work has now had to stop because we're uncertain as to whether the new government plans will actually include those structures that we had originally um, been working towards setting up. In terms of the wider um, piece around legacy, I think that this in reality will be our last opportunity um, to get this right. I think if we don't do this now, it will be too late to have made any real contribution um, to the situation. I think it's right that we should do it. There are, I guess, different views. Some people feel we need to move on and leave the past behind. Unfortunately, I think that historic um, and evidence bases would show that that isn't actually what happens, that people carry the past with them and you have transgenerational trauma. Um, and actually by not dealing with it in a, constructed, uh, in a constructive way and a comprehensive way, you simply continue to embed um, the problems of the past. So I think it's important that we do this. I also think as Justice Minister, it's important to me um, that people are able to access justice and that that isn't denied under the new dispensation because Many people feel that their right to justice, to seek truth, was denied in the past. And I believe that if we're going to have people's support and consent for our new structures and our, our new way forward, then that has to include people having access to justice where that is possible. We also need to be honest and say that for many people, they will not get the truth. They will not get um, resolution. They will not see someone prosecuted simply because the passage of time um, has made that impossible. Um, and so it's about realism um, and pragmatism, but also I think about having some sense that if we treat people with respect now, if we give them the opportunity to have their cases considered properly and, uh, and investigated and reviewed, then we're in a much better position to say that we can move forward. Where the Stormont House Agreement, I guess, was strongest was that it provided a timeline within which that could happen with a distinct endpoint so that cases could be reviewed. If there was a fixed amount of money that would be available for that, it would be done within a fixed amount of time. And at the other end of it, we would have dealt with legacy issues in a comprehensive way and in a way that meets the requirements under Article 2 um, in terms of human rights. So I think that there are challenges, there remain challenges around this. We haven't seen the kind of progress that I would have liked to have seen. But that doesn't mean that there isn't progress being made on legacy issues. What it means is that it isn't being done in a comprehensive way, that it's piecemeal. And unfortunately, I think that that 
that will continue. And I don't think not having Storm at House implemented will stop any of that. But it does mean that for some families, it will depend on how much energy and time and money they can invest in seeking truth, that whether or not they get it. And I would prefer there was a much more um, streamlined approach. There are a whole range of investigations that are ongoing at the moment. We have legacy inquests, which are proceeding, um, and those will take time. But we know, again, there is a fixed timeline over which those will be taken forward, and those are progressing as, as they should. Um, there are also um, le uh, legacy litigation cases against the PSNI, people who want their cases reviewed, who haven't been able to have those reviews take place because of limited resource and indeed because of court judgments that have now said that the PSNI as the successor to the RUC isn't sufficiently independent to investigate these cases. I think that is a challenge, to put it mildly, um, but it has left the PSNI with a huge amount um, of, of legacy litigation, which could be very costly, very time consuming, and it is consuming resource as well that should be policing today. So there will always be that challenge. It's true also with the police ombudsman, who also again handles legacy cases. So she will have a, a legacy set of cases to, to go through and to review where complaints have been received. But again, that's consuming time that she could be spending looking at current investigations. So I think it's important that we refocus our energy on trying to find a comprehensive way through rather than a piecemeal approach. Um, things like Operation Canova, where John Boucher and his team are looking very carefully at a number of cases, that's worked well for those, for those cases that they have the capacity to take. But there are a lot of other cases and there isn't the capacity for that to be replicated. So I think we need to find a comprehensive solution so that people can know that the cases have been properly reviewed, whether there's any evidence that is worth pursuing, whether any prosecution will be possible, and if not, that they are at least assured that that, that, that is a final decision and they're not left without knowing. And I think that that is the least that we can do. There are other things, though, that I think are important, and it's about how we deal with the past more generally narratives of the past, capturing um, the different narratives and the different stories and experiences of the past. I think that all of those things are important because I think if we don't learn from our history, we will end up repeating it. And that is always a risk. And for me, it's important that we capture that information. I lived through the trouble, so I know what it was like. But there's a whole generation of young people growing up now who, thank goodness, will never hopefully know what the troubles were like. But some of them are vulnerable um, to being lured into paramilitary organisations because these things become mythologised in society and people think that it is thrilling or exciting or a way of having status in the community um, if, if they don't otherwise have many opportunities. And so we need to, we need to be clear about what our past was like. We need to be honest about that. We need to fix what was wrong, but we also need to consider the future and how we can build reconciliation um, of our communities in as part of that historic process. Because I think unless we can come to, pay, uh, to be at peace with our past and with each other, um, we are not creating the kind of future for young people coming through now um, that I think we, we owe them. So it is a challenging area. One area where we are making progress um, is around the victim's pension, and that is for those who are severely injured, either physically or psychologically. And after a long and protracted battle that has now been designated to my department, um, I volunteered to take the work on. And we're now making good progress. And hopefully some of those victims who started this campaign 10 years ago um, we'll see those payments start to flow um, sometime next year and the, the application process will open in early March of next year. So I think that we can make progress where issues don't go away, um, but the solutions do. And I think that that's the real challenge that we have at the moment is to try to continue to engage, even though these are, are very sensitive and difficult conversations.
Great. Well, thank you, Minister. Uh, we've been over an hour and um, our Wi-Fi connections here clearly telling us we're on borrowed time. That said, there are a ton of amazing questions here. I can see questions on border polls, COVID and, and identity politics, um, Scotland and, and the European Union. We're going to have to have you back. But before we let you go, um, I do, there is one question here, I think, that we <laughs> end on. That's a, this is a great question. Um, th this person says they were born in Dublin, uh, studied at the University of Ulster, uh, moved to the U.S. and now have been here for 35 years. They're now the dean of the graduate school um, at University of New Hampshire, uh, you know, an amazing institution here in, in the Northeast. They want to know how can they help uh, with the wonderful progress that's taking place. They're thinking about biotech, cybersecurity, educational corporate partnerships. You know, for, for people here in the United States who are interested in Northern Ireland, you know, where should they go as a first stop? Well, I mean, I think there are lots of places. I mean, first of all, our two universities um, do lots of collaboration um, with other educational institutions. And I think that they would be more than delighted um, to help you with that. The Northern Ireland Bureau obviously is the perfect um, jump off point if you contact um, Andrew Elliott and his team um, and you have ideas for cooperation, collaboration and partnership. Um, he will be able to help with that. And just in small ways, I think just promoting what has happened in Northern Ireland um, as a positive. I mean, it has been a bumpy road. I mean, there have been times when, you know, we have really made a mess of things. Um, but I would hope that rather than us be very kind of negative and, and down about that, we realise that actually it shows some resilience. The people of Northern Ireland genuinely do want to make progress and live together peacefully. And the fact that every time politicians get it wrong, they're willing to let us pick up the pieces and try again, I think is an inspiration actually. So we should look at that in a positive light um, and try to build on that. But I know that the in terms of business, that one of the big issues at the moment, things like cybersecurity and so on, we have some really good work ongoing, um, both in our innovation labs down um, in, the, um, in the innovation center um, in my own constituency uh, where Titanic um, was built many, many years ago. Uh, we are now building um, very different things in terms of technology and, and innovation. Um, there's a massive um, creative arts sector here and film industry has become a really, um, a really burgeoning part of our economy. So there are lots of positives about Northern Ireland. Um, yes, there are challenges, but I think that that's true in every society. Art are, are quite unique and quite complex. But I think in every society you will go to, history has its own way of making life difficult in the present. And it's whether or not you can rise above it and deliver for the people um, who you represent um, and be able to deliver change for the future. I think those have to be our, our focuses. So I think definitely if there are ways that people want to engage with Northern Ireland, with business and academia, I think it would be more than welcome. Um, and we already have very strong partnerships, but we're always open to more because I think we recognise that those partnerships um, and I suppose it's one of the reasons I come back to it, but it's one of the reasons why I'm sad about our loss in terms of the European Union, because I actually think we have a huge amount we can learn from each other. And I think every opportunity for us to come together and share experiences um, and share our learning is actually a really important opportunity um, in terms of informing how we go forward. So we would very much welcome anyone um, getting in touch. Um, and I think that the Northern Ireland Bureau is the perfect place to make that contact. So hopefully they will then be able to point you to the right department or the right um, contact in Northern Ireland to be able to um, be involved in what we're doing. Great, well, thank you. I think this is a great place to end on. Minister, I wanna thank you for your time and, and for your fulsome answers. Uh, to the audience, I wanna thank you for joining us and, and staying with us through some of the connectivity issues. I apologize, I see 12, 13 outstanding questions right now. I'm embarrassed by how many we failed to get to today. Uh, they're great questions. Um, we'll have to have you back, um, Minister. Uh, thank you again. Thank you finally to the Northern Ireland Thank Europe, you. Andrew and, and the team and your team for, for helping to facilitate this. This is really, um, this has been an exciting event for us here at Boston College and an outstanding partnership that I look to um, continue to grow. Um, thank you, everyone, and we'll talk to you soon, Minister. Thank you very much, Bo. Thank you, uh, Minister, as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.